This hearing will come to order. Without objection, the chairman is authorized to declare recess at any time. Before I deliver my opening remarks, I wanted to note that today the committee is meeting both in person and virtually. I want to announce a couple of reminders to the members about the conduct of this hearing. First, members and staff who are attending in person may choose to be masked, but it is not a requirement. However, any individuals with symptoms, a positive test, or exposure to someone with COVID-19 should wear a mask while present. Members who are attending virtually should keep their video feed on as long as they are present in the hearing. Members are responsible for their own microphones. Please also keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking. Finally, if members have documents they wish to submit for the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the hearing. Good morning, and thank you to our panel of esteemed witnesses for joining us today to discuss the research and infrastructure needs of the Department of Energy in the exciting fields of high energy physics and nuclear science. As part of the discussion today, we will examine the critical research and facilities supported by DOE's Office of Science, Energy, Physics, and Nuclear Physics programs, as well as related work in its accelerator and isotope programs. I especially want to welcome the newly Senate-confirmed Director of the Office of Science, Dr. Berhey, to her first appearance before Congress since being confirmed. I look forward to working with you and congratulations. As chairman of the Subcommittee on Energy, I often reflect on how the work we do here will prepare us for a better and brighter future for everyone. Experts such as yourselves help us to understand and fight for better policies here in Congress that will enable a healthier and safer world through innovations in science and technology. We need to keep these big picture goals top of mind with everything we do. We need to continue to take urgent action to make these goals a reality. This starts with supporting robust funding across our scientific enterprise. In April, I chaired a hearing in which DOE's Undersecretary for Science and Innovation, Dr. Geraldine Richmond, testified on the importance of strong federal science programs to maintain our scientific leadership and tackle the problems of the 21st century, including the climate crisis. We discussed the lackluster fiscal year 2023 budget request from the administration for DOE's Office of Science at length and the impact that will have on our goals by insufficiently supporting large-scale scientific experiments, research, and associated facilities. We need to do much, much better. But the budget request is not the sole focus of today's hearing, though I'm certain it will be part of the discussion. We are here to discuss the fields of high energy physics and nuclear physics, which probe some of the biggest unanswered questions on the most basic nature of our world. What is the universe made of? Why is the universe made of something rather than nothing? And how do the materials that make up the universe stay together? We are able to push the frontiers of human knowledge on these topics through cutting edge research and large experiments that attract international participation, including by supporting the diverse scientific workforce that is necessary to the success of these programs. A related area of nuclear science that we'll be discussing today is on nuclear isotope research, development, and production. Isotopes are materials that we use every day to enhance our lives. Dozens of isotopes are produced worldwide for unique applications, ranging from cancer research to powering batteries in space ex exploration to making the food we consume safer, and the list goes on. Unfortunately, many isotopes have a single source in the entire world, and many of those rely on Russia in some part of the supply chain. Like many commodities, the nation's isotope supply is at risk due to the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Even without policy action banning the isotope trade between the U.S. and Russia specifically, our supply is threatened by the impacts we are already seeing in the banking and shipping industries. We need to have these conversations to better enable a secure and resilient U.S. isotope supply. Before I close, I want to acknowledge the important role that these fundamental scientific fields play in enhancing our well-being. Humanity has always been driven to understand the nature of the universe and our place within it. Thanks to federal support for this kind of research, unprecedented discoveries are within our grasp. 
Another huge benefit of fundamental research is the, application, is the applications it can have on a nation's health, prosperity, and security. For example, the research supported by the Office of Science in these high energy and nuclear science fields contribute to advanced technology development, such as artificial intelligence and quantum information science. The materials, properties, and interactions we discover in these programs are directly applicable to the development of microelectronics, which in turn are used to strengthen the experiments these programs steward. These are cross-cutting areas of scientific importance to our country's future. I just want to emphasize this point to my colleagues here in Congress as we work to support robust and historic authorizations for these federal science programs and bipartisan, bicameral conference negotiations on national competitive policies. With that said, thank you all again for being here today, and I look forward to this discussion. The chair now recognizes Mr. Weber for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The title of today's hearing is Investigating the Nature of Matter, Energy, Space, and Time. It certainly sounds like a daunting task. However, there are three programs within the Department of Energy's Office of Science that are doing exactly that. The High Energy Physics Program probes the fundamental characteristics of matter and energy, including interactions through the study of particle physics. This program supports research and development activities that involve investigating the nature of dark matter, accelerating particles to the highest energies ever produced by man, and colliding them to study the results, and then using particle beams and detectors to discover new physics. As you can imagine, studying the smallest building blocks of matter requires cutting-edge facilities. Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, the particle physics and accelerator laboratory within the department's national laboratory complex hosts thousands of scientists from all over the world. Their accelerator, detector, and computing facilities are some of the best in the entire world, and more exciting new projects are under construction. One such project, the Long Baseline Neutrino Facility and Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, or LBNF Dune, will be the first large-scale international science facility in the U.S. It will help us answer some of the most fundamental questions we have about our universe, including why matter exists. This is valuable science that will continue to support our position at the cutting edge of discovery. However, building these facilities will take a steady funding stream commitment, and recent budget requests from administration are low and would actually extend completion dates, which will risk our international advantage. We will also discuss the progress of the Office of Science Nuclear Physics Program, which provides approximately 95% of the U.S. investment in fundamental nuclear physics research. To support this work, the Department has initiated construction of the Electronic Ion Collider located at Brookhaven National Lab. The Electronic Ion Collider will collide high-energy electrons with high-energy protons and nuclei to produce a view of these particles' inner structure. Last but not least, we will assess, assess the Office of Science Isotope Research and Development Program and its role in preventing shortages of the stable and radioactive isotopes needed for essential activities such as medical treatments, industrial processes, and explosive detection, just to name a few. In addition to conducting research and development on isotope production and processing techniques, this program produces and distributes critical isotopes that are in short supply or that no domestic entity can produce. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has underscored the importance of this program and the risks of reliance on foreign supply chains for critical isotopes. And let me opine kind of parenthetically that that's true in so many instances we need to be, we need to be producing things here. We need to have that, our supply chain right here in the good old U.S. of A. For example, we currently rely on Russia's State Nuclear Energy Corporation and its subsidiaries to supply us with a number of critical medical and industrial isotopes. We must pursue domestic production solutions to counter this disturbing vulnerability and a whole lot of others I just mentioned. We will not effectively address our most urgent energy-related challenges such as lowering household energy costs or reducing dependence on foreign supply chains if we neglect the fundamental research and development required to unlock the next generation of technologies. Additionally, if we do not demonstrate a commitment to maintaining and modernizing our research infrastructure, 
we actually risk losing our seat at the head of the table when it comes to international scientific standing. For those reasons, I'm proud to be part of the Science Committee's ongoing bipartisan effort to get H.R. 3593, the DOE Science for the Future Act, enacted into law. This legislation authorizes robust funding for all three Office of Science programs I highlighted, as well as LBNF, LBNF Dune, the Electronic Ion Collider, and other critical infrastructure projects. This legislation is absolutely critical to supporting the future of U.S. research and development, and I'm hopeful we can move it forward as we negotiate our competitiveness legislation with the Senate. I thank all of their witnesses for their testimony today. Dr. Berhey, can I offer my word of congratulations also on your recent confirmation as the Director of the Office of Science, and we are delighted to have you appear for the first time before the committee today. Please don't make it your last. <laughs> so uh, I look forward to working with you to ensure the success of the office, and I want to say uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Weber. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I would like to introduce our witnesses. Dr. Asmaret Berhe is the Director of the Office of Science at the Department of Energy. She is on leave from the University of California, Merced, where she is a professor of soil biochemistry and holds the Ted and Jan Filasco Chair in Earth Sciences and Geology. Dr. Berhe's scientific leadership has been recognized by multiple national awards, including the Joanne Simpson Medal from the American Geophysical Union, the Brummery Award, and the Geological Society of America, and she was selected as a new voice in science from the U.S. National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine in 2018. Dr. Berhe also is a founding investigator of the Advanced Geo Partnership a National Science Foundation funded effort to empower geoscientists to transform their workplace climate through interventions to reduce harassment, discrimination, and bullying. Dr. Brian Green is a professor of physics at Columbia University and director of Columbia's Center for Theoretical Physics. He is recognized for a number of groundbreaking discoveries in his field of superstring theory, including the discoveries of mirror symmetry and topology change. Dr. Green has written four New York Times bestsellers that explore physics for general audiences. He also co-founded the World Science Festival, which aims to cultivate a general public inf informed by science and take science out of the laboratory and into the streets of New York City and beyond. Dr. Leah Merminga is the director of Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory and a renowned accelerator physicist. She previously led the Proton Improvement Plan 2 project at Fermilab that will enable the world's most intense neutrino beam for the lab's flagship long baseline neutrino facility and a deep underground neutrino experiment, LBNF Dune, and drive a broad physics research program. Dr. Marminga has held leadership roles at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory in California, Triumph in Vancouver, Canada and the Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility in Virginia. She is, Fermi, she is a Fermilab Distinguished Scientist and a Fellow of the American Physical Society and a graduate of the Department of Energy's Oppenheimer Energy Science Leadership Program. Mr. Jim Yek is the Associate Laboratory Director and the Project Director for the Electron Ion Collider at Brookhaven National Laboratory. He has over 30 years of project managing experience, including serving as the Director General of the European Spallation Source. He has also previously served as the Department of Energy's project manager for the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider and a U.S. Co contribution to the Large Hadron Collider. As project director for the construction of the Ice Cube Neutrino Op Observatory and as the de deputy project manager for the National Synchrotron Light Source 2 facility at Brookhaven. Mr. Yek serves as chair for numerous advisory committees for large projects supported by DOE, NSF, and international funding agencies. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Michael Gustella is the executive director of the Council on Radion Nuclides and Radio Pharmaceuticals, Inc., or CORAR. CARAR is a trade association that represents developers, manufacturers, and distributors of radio pharmaceuticals and radioisotopes. 
Prior to Karar, he worked in the nuclear pharmacy industry with both Syncor International Corporation and Cardinal Health, holding a number of leadership positions over 18 years. Mr. Gustello has served on the Karar Board of Directors for 10 years. Thank you all for joining us today. As our witnesses should know, you will have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When you all have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel. We will start with Dr. Berhe. Dr. Berhe, please begin. Thank you, Ch Chairman Bowman, Ranking Member Weber, and the distinguished members of the committee. It's with great pleasure that I join you today to represent the Department of Energy at this hearing on the Office of Science. As members of this committee know, it was only a little over a month ago that I was sworn in as the director of the Office of Science. But I have a long history with the Department of Energy, dating to my time as a graduate student when I was a PhD student at Berkeley, when I conducted research at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and the Pacific Northwest National Lab, both Office of Science stewarded laboratories, and I'm deeply familiar with the research goals of the Office of Science. Perhaps the deepest and most awe-inspiring questions humanity asks are about the nature of matter, energy, space, and time. Today, world-leading research into these questions is being conducted by scientists supported by the Office of Science's programs on high-energy physics, nuclear physics, and isotope research and development and production. The Office of Science is crucial to progress in these fields. We provide approximately 85% of the funding um, in particle physics research and 90% of the funding in nuclear physics research in the United States. As director, it is my priority to ensure that these and all other Office of Science programs are robustly supported and maintain their world-leading status. High energy and nuclear physics, as much as any scientific endeavors, demonstrate that scientific research is evolving more rapidly, perhaps than most times since the scientific revolution. Science in these fields is also becoming more reliant on large scale, cutting edge facilities and technologies, is becoming more data centric and more democratic. The Office of Science is uniquely positioned to support these transformations and to unlock the future of science and technology. Large-scale, multi-institutional, multidisciplinary science is the core competence of the Office of Science. Research we support, including in high energy and nuclear physics programs, requires some of the largest and most complex experimental facilities ever designed and built. The Office of Science makes these projects a reality. We, are, we not only support the construction and management and operation of the facilities, but also the research and development of new technologies needed to realize their scientific potential. Science in the fields of high energy physics and nuclear physics also prioritizes the production, dissemination, and analysis of massive amounts of data in both fields, experiments, um, experiments that are done in both fields um, have tens of millions of events that are generated in largest and most complex scientific instruments ever designed. The resulting big data must be captured, curated, stored, um, shared among scientists and analyzed using the fastest supercomputers and most sophisticated algorithms in the world. The Office of Science uniquely has the expertise and infrastructure needed to achieve these Herculean tasks enormous data repositories, the fastest trans data transfer networks, the world's fastest performance computers, including Frontier, the nation's first exascale computer at Oak Ridge National Lab, and the expert staff needed to leverage these tools for discovery. Further, many of these technologies end up benefiting society outside the lab in fields as diverse as national security and medicine. The Department of Energy's isotope and R&D and production program, stewarded by the Office of Science, supports world-leading research and development to create novel and more efficient isotope production and processing techniques. Isotopes are vital for ensuring the nation's security and prosperity and enabling components and technologies used for numerous mission-critical applications. 
Russia's invasion of Ukraine has significantly impacted the availability of many critical isotopes, given Russia's outsized role in isotope production and distribution in the world. Remo removing US dependence on Russian isotopes is a long-term project for the department, one we began five years ago and continue today. We are committed to building the needed infrastructure to pr produce critical isotopes domestically and will continue to work tirelessly with our federal, industrial, and academic partners to help alleviate the challenge with isotope supply in the near term. Across all scientific areas we support, the Office of Science is committed to training, recruitment, retention of highly skilled workforce that draws from the best minds across the full spectrum of backgrounds and cultures within the nation. In closing, the DOE's Office of Science is supporting science that continues to push the frontiers of knowledge today and will enable discoveries of tomorrow. DOE Office of Science is uniquely capable of providing the physical, human, and intellectual infrastructure needed to do big, multi-institutional, multidisciplinary science and do it well. And we deliver the science and technology needed for building cutting, the cutting edge science and experimental facilities and for training the diverse and talented STEM for workforce that the future will demand. With support for infrastructure and continuing programs for developing the diverse and highly skilled workforce, the Office of Science will continue to provide insights into the fundamental nature of matter, energy, space, and time. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with this subcommittee, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much. Next, we will have Dr. Green. Thank you so much for this privilege to speak about some of the vital issues of science as it relates to the future of the United States. Now, in my professional life, I actually wear two related hats. First, I direct the Center for Theoretical Physics at Columbia University, where I undertake mathematical research to investigate nature's forces and to determine what the insights so reveal can tell us about the fundamental structure of space and time. The goal being to answer some of the questions we've already heard. What is matter made of? Does space go on forever? What happened before the Big Bang? Questions that puzzle young children, and even adults who have an interest in understanding their place in the cosmic order. My second professional preoccupation is related but distinct, bringing cutting edge scientific insights to broad swaths of the general public through books and articles, television documentaries, live public events, performances, activities that can reach and have reached hundreds of millions of people worldwide. And while I'm Happy to share in the question period relevant insights from either of these pursuits, research or public engagement, as my distinguished colleagues on the panel will speak directly to various and vital research efforts. I'm going to focus my remarks on the impact that public engagement with science has on the health and vitality now and in the long run of our country and the world. Now, part of this impact is manifest. We've already heard some of it. I suspect at least a few of us are old enough to think back to our own experiences with rotary telephone, electric typewriters, bottles of whiteout. And for those of us who are technically savvy in that earlier era, large stacks of computer punch cards ready to be loaded into card readers, delivering instructions to massive computers that filled entire rooms. And while I can personally testify to having experienced all of that, and they're fond memories, I admit, I can't imagine going back to those days. And historians, of course, can trace with great detail the roots of our modern electronic age, but the coarse yet sufficiently accurate summary is that the modern era emerged from breakthroughs in the very subjects we're talking about here today, understanding the constituents of matter and the forces that govern these constituents. And briefly put, if you want to manipulate matter on small scales, the very capacity at the core of everything, from cell phones to the relatively tiny computers sitting on our desks, you have to understand matter on small scales. And here is the amazing thing. In the 1920s, as researchers were feverishly rewriting our understanding of matter on subatomic scales, it's a body of work known as quantum mechanics, they had no idea what impact their revelations would one day have were the scientific titans of those early pursuits who have testified here 
and were you to have asked them how their work would impact the world, most would have focused on things like human curiosity, the human urge to understand with barely a mention of the far off and at that time difficult to envision applications. And yet, fast forward 100 years and a non-trivial portion of the gross national product of the United States can be traced back to those seemingly esoteric investigations into the heart of matter, forces, and energy, which is a wonderful demonstration of how the fundamental science of one era can become the economic engine of the next. And of course, the impact goes well beyond economics. As my colleague today will no doubt mention, sophisticated and life-saving medical diagnostics and medical treatments have also emerged from these foundational scientific works. So it is anything but hyperbolic to describe these scientific pursuits as having radically transformed both life and death. Now, this is heavy stuff. These are profound impacts. Yet to leave the discussion there would be to miss what I consider an even more important aspect, which is this. The reason science really matters is because science is a way of life. Science is a perspective. Science is the process that takes us from confusion to understanding in a manner that's precise, predictive, and reliable, a transformation for those lucky enough to experience it that is empowering and emotional. To be able to think through and grasp explanations for everything from why the sky is blue to how life formed on Earth, not because they are declared dogma, but rather because they reveal patterns confirmed by experiment and observation. Well, I must tell you that is one of the most precious of human experiences. Now, to be sure, as a practicing scientist, I know this from my own work and study, but I also know that you don't have to be a scientist to experience the transformative power of science. I've seen kids' eyes light up as I've told them about black holes in the Big Bang. And I've, I've spoken with high school dropouts who stumbled on popular science books and then returned to school with newfound purpose. I received letters from soldiers on the battlefield and incarcerated prisoners. I'm sorry, Dr. Beginning. Green, you're, you're a few seconds over. Uh, we'll come back to you on questioning. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, we will have Dr. Merminga. Thank you. Um, Energy Subcommittee Chairman Bauman and Ranking Member Weber and other distinguished members of the subcommittee. I'm Leah Merminga, Director of Fermilab since two months ago, uh, and honored to speak with you today about high energy physics. As we meet here today, the U.S. high energy physics community is getting ready to assemble in, snow in Seattle for what is called SNOMAS, the decadal planning exercise that outlines the future vision of particle physics. From SNOMAS, the Particle Physics Project Prioritization Panel, or P5, will produce a 10-year plan that prioritizes major projects and experiments to maintain the United States global leadership in the field. Particle physics research probes from the smallest constituents of matter to the entire cosmos in pursuit of the most profound questions of humanity. How did our universe come to be? How does it work? And why are we here? But investing in physics research goes beyond helping us understand such fundamental questions. We also push the boundaries of knowledge and develop technologies that improve lives. The cross-cutting nature of our research fosters applications beyond particle physics. Emerging technologies such as quantum science, artificial intelligence, and novel microelectronics find great synergy with our core HEP mission. This has engendered new frontiers well beyond their initial scopes, MRIs, proton therapy, X-ray lasers, and the World Wide Web have all resulted from particle physics research and collaboration. Continued investment in HEP, including in research, infrastructure, and people are critical to driving major discoveries and new technologies in the future. HEP is a powerful training ground that attracts and inspires young minds 
and helps build the best and most diverse STEM workforce. HEP students and researchers develop state-of-the-art technologies, build tools to handle massive data, and cultivate the creativity to bring the imagined into reality, whether in HEP or in other STEM pursuits. And particle physics is a global endeavor. We work with almost every country in the world, and our flagship projects are great examples of this collaboration. The 2014 P5 report recommended Fermilab to host the largest and most complex neutrino research program ever undertaken. The Long Baseline Neutrino Facility, or LBNF, will provide the infrastructure for the massive Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, or DUNE, largest international scientific project on U.S. soil. LBNF crews are now excavating caverns a mile underground at the Sanford Lab in South Dakota, while 1,400 DUNE collaborators from over 35 countries are building the cutting-edge detectors that will fill these caverns starting as early as 2024. LBNF Dune will be powered by Fermilab's new superconducting accelerator known as PIP2, the first built with significant international contributions. In fact, together, LBNF Dune and PIP2 have attracted more than $1 billion in in-kind contributions from international partners, including CERN, the European Particle Physics Laboratory, marking its first time investing in physics outside Europe. 2,100 US scientists use CERN's Large Hadron Collider for their research. Since its startup, more than 2,000 scientific results have been published, including the Higgs boson discovery in 2012. Ongoing LHC upgrades will enable scientists to unlock key questions in particle physics for decades to come. LBNF, DUNE, PIP2, and LHC upgrades are our highest priorities at Fermilab. The projects are proceeding well, and we are incredibly grateful to the Department of Energy for their support thus far, particularly in helping us to address the challenges of LBNF Dune and accelerating its schedule. Our international partners have seen the US's ongoing commitment and investment in these efforts, and this has resulted in expanding contributions and our sustained global leadership in the field. I thank the members of this distinguished subcommittee for your attention, your continued support of the DOE Office of Science means we can continue to pursue our, the mysteries of the universe and improve lives both here in the United States and around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we will have Mr. Yak. And Mr. Yak, let's try to make it in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman Bowman, Ranking Member Weber, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be, appear before you today. My name is Jim Yak. I have participated in and led big science projects around the world as noted in my introduction by Chairman Bowman. I'm here today as project director for the Electron Ion Collider, or EIC, a nuclear physics research facility being built at Brookhaven Lab in New York in partnership with Virginia's Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility and funded by the US Department of Energy's Office of Science. I thank the committee for authorizing the EIC as part of the American Competes Act of 2022. Today, our today, all our technologies and much of our economy depend on what we've learned about the atom and its orbiting electrons. Experiments on the behavior of electrons in the last century led to the development of batteries, semiconductors, smart materials, and more. With an EIC, we will be able to look inside the atom nucleus to image its constituents, the quarks and gluons. EIC experiments will reveal how the strong nuclear force drives interactions among completely massless gluons and nearly massless quarks to build up the mass, structure, and properties of visible matter in the universe. Like the discoveries of the last century that power today's electronic-centered society, new discoveries about gluons could lead to the technologies of tomorrow. Tools we are developing for the EIC could also lead to new innovative accelerators for making and testing computer chips, 
killing cancer cells and designing drugs and new materials. Detector technologies for medicine and national security. And computational tools that can be applied to modeling climate change, global pandemics, even financial markets. EIC planning has been underway for more than two decades. The nuclear science community and the national academies consider its scientific promise to be timely, compelling, and worthy of investment. Our field has a strong track record of delivering on the goals laid out through this careful planning process and for delivering projects within budget. As a project leader, my key ingredients of success include ensuring the project remains a priority of the science community, securing funding commitments and establishing a strong role of the host funding agency and laboratory, appointing project leaders who enable the success of all stakeholders, encouraging collective ownership of problems and solutions, establishing realistic goals, making the most of the team's experience and sustaining energy and enthusiasm over the decade required to construct the project. To make the EIC a reality, we need all of these ingredients. I'm confident that we have the scientific and technical know-how, the team, and other ingredients in place, but I am concerned about the current funding realities. EIC construction cost estimates range from 1.7 to 2.8 billion. That investment will create thousands of jobs in construction, materials, and manufacturing in New York State, Virginia, and beyond, and hundreds of highly skilled technical jobs over the EIC's operational lifetime. Brookhaven Lab was selected as the EIC site in part to capitalize on the $2 billion plus already invested in RIC, the only operating collider in the U.S. RIC and its team of talent will serve as a backbone for the EIC after RIC's scientific mission is complete in 2025. Reusing components of RIC and leveraging its highly trained workforce with its decades of experience will reduce the overall EIC project costs and ensure the hand up, handoff of knowledge from today's scientists engineers and technicians to the next generation critical to building and operating the new facility. But without several years of sufficient dedicated funding to ensure a smooth transition from RIC to EIC, we anticipate layoffs impacting those same individuals. To date, funding has been well below the levels required to keep the project on course and on budget. Funding constraints also affect our ability to attract the next generation of American physicists, technicians, and engineers and will compromise U.S. leadership and competitiveness in accelerator science and nuclear physics. And those constraints will also impact our international partnerships. Currently, a robust EIC user community of about 1,300 scientists from 250 institutions around the globe have been helping to develop the science program. Finally, a word about education. Brookhaven Lab takes great pride in its internship programs with a 50-50 gender diversity mix and nearly 40% of our students coming from underrepresented groups. These populations are developing the diverse workforce of the future. The EIC will be a unique resource for driving that progression. I hope this testimony convinces you of the enormous value and investment in the electron ion collider will deliver to our nation and the need for sufficient funding to make it a reality. EIC will extend the frontiers of discovery, lead to benefits to science and society, and maintain our nation's undisputed leadership and competitiveness in nuclear, accelerator, detector, and computational science, areas essential to economic advancement, national security, and technological development for decades to come. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Yek. And finally, we will have Mr. Guastella. Good morning, Chairman Bauman, Ranking Member Weber, and members of the committee. I'm Michael Guastella, the Executive Director of the Council on Radionuclides and Radiopharmaceuticals. We're an association of companies that manufacture and distribute radioactive sources and medical isotopes here in the United States. Thank you for the opportunity to provide the committee with our comments on the current supply of radioactive and stable isotopes. Our supply chain issues have been the focus of several government efforts over the last 15 years to address the lack of a reliable and sufficient supply of domestic medical and industrial isotopes and the recent invasion, Russian invasion of Ukraine highlights further these issues. The problem is significant, and my member companies are appreciative of the committee's interest in these issues and our suggestions on what needs to be done. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Weber, for your support and assistance over the last several years. Your committee has recognized the importance of medical and industrial isotopes, and you have advocated for federal policies that would ensure that our patients have the isotopes necessary for the diagnosis and treatment of disease. 
Nuclear medicine involves the injection of medical radioactive isotopes and radiopharmaceuticals into a patient's body to diagnose and treat disease. Nuclear medicine is integral to the care of patients, and we estimate that there are 20 million nuclear medicine procedures performed annually for diseases such as cancer, heart disease, Parkinson's disease, and Alzheimer's disease. Now let me update the committee on U.S. isotope supply challenges and opportunities. There are over 40 stable and radioactive isotopes that we have identified that are important for medical or industrial purposes and that the U.S. relies largely on Russian companies to supply. For example, to serve U.S. patients, a significant portion of the molybdenum-99 supply chain relies on uranium-235 that is sourced from Russia. Several other isotopes uh, sourced from Russia include stable isotope zinc-68, which is used for the production of therapeutic uh, this, the therapeutic radioisotope copper-67, gadolinium-153 for calibrating medical devices, and krypton-85 used in industrial sealed sources to measure thickness and density. Various companies are currently developing reactor and non-reactor capabilities to help scale up domestic production of essential isotopes. However, these commercial activities may not be adequate to address the immediate risks to the radioactive and stable isotope supply chains posed by the Russian, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and potential sanctions being considered on Russian suppliers by the U.S. and our allies. DOE especially plays a critical role in producing and distributing isotopes needed in scientific research and for initial medical clinical development and industrial purposes when there are not sufficient commercial incentives for production of such isotopes. Coror and its member companies believe that where commercially feasible, medical and industrial isotopes should be produced by the private sector. However, for a number of these isotopes where commercial domestic production has not been established or is not sufficient to meet U.S. medical and industrial needs, the DOE isotope program can potentially provide a bridge to ensure domestic supply. Corar would recommend that the, con the committee continue to support the DOE's research development, and production activities. CORAR supports your committee's work contained in Section 311 of the America Competes Act of 2022. Provisions of the Compe uh, Competes Act will improve the mission of the DOE isotope program, including the establishment of a new advisory committee and the authorization of appropriations for the DOE isotope program to be used to support the new DOE isotope the DOE Stable Isotope Production and Research Center, Radioisotope Processing Facility, and the Clinical Alpha Radionuclide Pro uh, Producer Project. However, the current level of funding supports project completion timelines that stretch to the early 2030s. CORAR encourages the committee to consider accelerating the authorization of appropriation rate for the DOE isotope program that would allow these projects to be completed on an accelerated timeline, ideally over the next four to five years. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I would be pleased to answer your questions. At this point, we will begin our first round of questions. The chairman now recognizes himself for five minutes. My first question goes to Mr. Yak. It's for you as the director, the project director of the Electron Ion Collider, which is funded and supported by the DOE Office of Science Nuclear Physics Program and located in my state of New York. I understand from your testimony that research at this facility will not only continue to advance our fundamental understanding of matter and reality, but could also pave the way for further breakthroughs in medicine, electronics, advanced computing, and much more. Can you please elaborate on how the electron ion collider is envisioned to contribute to maintaining our country's leadership and innovation in, the, in these and other critical technology areas? Thank you. So the, one of the features of the electron ion collider is that it's an extremely challenging and complex machine which requires innovations in accelerator physics. And uh, the, uh, the result that we're pursuing performance parameters that push the envelope in terms of the energy of the collisions, the luminosity, the polarization of the beams. All of these techniques have been used in the past to benefit other fields. 
So it's basically the, the development of the accelerator science and technology, which is motivating the interest of collaborators around the world. And the detector technologies are also quite challenging. And his history as any guide, as was discussed earlier in other testimony, this is made available to these other fields. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Berhey, can you comment on this as well? Yes, I agree with um, Dr. Mr. Yek that, you know, the electron ion collider represents an important, uh, thank you, first of all, uh, for your question, Congress, Congressman. Um, and as I said, I agree with uh, Mr. Yek on the importance of this incredibly um, exciting facility that the science community is um, looking forward to. Um, and, and I also agree that uh, even though some of these um, research questions that the facility might address might be more fundamental, there are significant advances and benefits that we can look forward to um, from these facilities. And I think is a really good reason why there is a widespread su uh, support for this facility and the science that it will enable um, across the board in the Office of Science. Thank you. My next question is for Dr. Green. Um, thank you for your testimony. Here on the Science Committee, we have delved deep into how to better involve students in STEM around the country from K to 12 to the university and graduate level. Uh, in your written testimony, you state that the American education system has failed to teach science effectively. You go on to say that as a society, we are too focused on what science can do for us instead of valuing science for how it can change the way we understand and see the world. Can you describe this educational failure? How can we here on the Science Committee and in Congress in general address that problem? Yeah, thank you for the question. Briefly put, we focus in the classroom on teaching kids the details of science so that they can regurgitate it back on an exam so we can evaluate them. But science is not simply the details. Science is the big ideas, ideas that we've already heard in the testimony from many on the panel today. And if you can take a kid out to the stars and reveal to them the wonders of the cosmos and the wonders of life and the wonders of mind, this can inspire them to wanna to learn the details. So I think there needs to be a fairly significant shift in the way that we teach science to the young and the way we bring adults and families into the scientific enterprise because ultimately what we're doing is continuing a journey that our species has been on for thousands of years. And we have, as a species, tried to understand ourselves in the cosmos, and it's perhaps the most exciting of adventure stories. So what we need to do is extol science as something vital to life and fund the ability of scientists to go out into the world and spread the message of how these ideas can help us shape our place in the universe. Thank you very much. Uh, I yield back the balance of my time and now recognize Mr. Weber for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We can all agree that isotopes are strategic commodities that are essential to nations, um, economic, scientific, medical treatments, industry, national security is not negotiable or replaceable. Um, therefore, I'm extremely concerned about DOE's solution, or dare I say the lack thereof, to the instability of the isotope supply chain resulting from the Russian aggression in Ukraine. So Dr. Berhe, welcome, welcome <laughs> once again here. We'll give you one of the hard questions first. I'll ask you. Um, what exactly is DOE's short-term outlook here, and do you believe that the department's plan to build both a stable isotope production and research center and a radioisotope processing facility will be quick enough and sustainable enough in the long term to avoid the, short, the supply shortage that is already appearing absolutely inevitable? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Um, I agree with you that the um, importance of isotopes is clear, as was elaborated by my colleagues on the panel, um, and the urgency of this matter is also very, very clear. 
Um, one thing I could say is the fact that contingency planning for scenarios like what we're experiencing right now actually started at the DOE about five years ago. So we've been anticipating and planning for something like this um, and disruptions. Um, and as a result, we've been able to actually speed, speed up production in facilities uh, that are existing but also are continuing to push for newer facilities to come online as soon as possible. And we appreciate the bipartisan support that we've received from your committee um, on this, on this um, area. Um, and as you know, it was discussed earlier, the two um, stabilized stove and this stabilized stove facility, as well as the radioisotope production facility that are in construction, um, are gonna be very critical for helping us address the needs. Um, I want to be clear also about the fact that this is an extremely technically challenging area, so there's not going to be any very, very quick fixes in the matter. But I think, as has been demonstrated in the last several months, um, the DOE facilities and the person, uh, personnel involved in this work and the partnerships that we have with both universities and the industry have been able to limit um, the impact of the supply chain disruptions because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, and we'll continue to work with the Congress as well as these uh, different stakeholders to make sure that we address these issues. Um, in the short term, there might be some challenges, obviously, um, but I think continuing um, to receive good support for these upcoming facilities will definitely help us bring them online faster um, in the timelines that hopefully can um, alleviate even more significant Well, well let me ask you two questions as follow-up on that, Doctor, and that is number one, uh, if that process was inevitable five years ago, inevitable, viewed as inevitable five years ago, where are we in that process, number one? And the second question is, how long are you on loan from the university? Um, well, t to answer your first, second question first, um, I'm, I'm in this position uh, for, you know, I'm a presidential appointee, so, um, <laughs> but tr I think I rest assured though, um, it, this is not about me or one person, right? Obviously there's a program and dedicated staff with DOE. Is there an administrator to that process? Yes, yes there is, and who is there that? is a program, Joanne, um, Gell, Gell, <laughs> Gillian, <laughs> sorry, <Okay. laughs> last name, I'm butchering it a little bit. But Joanne Gillen is the, the uh, program manager for isotopes. Um, and I, I should also mention that um, the scientific community in this area has been very invested. As you heard, um, they're trying to set up their own advisory committee, actually, outside NP and continue. And, and if I may interrupt in that, in that answer, do we think that we have to build a facility like this each time, or could we get the private industry on board as quickly as possible and have them taking this over? Um, I think, as has been demonstrated, uh, there's multiple different pathways that could be followed in the long term. Um, obviously, many of us have been engaged in the short term trying to address with the facilities that we already have and ones that have been planned and are con currently um, under construction. But there are obviously possibilities around the world um, to do this in different ways. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, I'll go ahead and yield back. Thank you. The, gentle, the gentlewoman from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici, is now recognized. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Bowman, and Ranking Member Weber, and thank you for our witnesses for being here this morning. I'm honored to be selected as a member of the conference committee tasked with negotiating a bipartisan innovation package. And as part of the House passed version of this legislation, the Science Committee included a provision authorizing nearly $1 billion over five years to establish a development demonstration and commercialization program at the Department of Energy to strengthen our global competitiveness in the field of microelectronics. The House passed bill would establish microelectronic micro science research centers to address the foundational challenges in design, development, and manufacturing. So the district I represent in Northwest Oregon is often referred to as the Silicon Forest. It's particularly affected by innovation in microelectronics. We have thousands of my constituents and more than 40,000 Oregonians currently work in the semiconductor industry. So I wanna ask Dr. Marit Minga, in your written testimony, you note that Fermilab 
is a leader in advancing science and technology that drive advancements in microelectronics capabilities. So will you please expand on the interplay between the DOE's high energy physics program and microelectronics development and offer your perspective on why our national labs are uniquely positioned to accelerate progress in advanced microelectronics research and development? Thank you very much for this question. So Fermilab experiments create massive streams of data at very high rates. Just to give you an idea, <clears throat> excuse me, the data generated per second in just one large collider physics experiment, like the LHC, is equivalent to the average internet traffic across North America. Now, in order to monitor this data and make decisions about what events to read out, uh, the, the readout must be located on the detectors themselves. So this, the, the, this creates naturally a need for microelectronics co-design, which is a prerequisite to allow us to interpret and monitor the data that we produce in our large scale particle physics experiments. It's part of our business. In addition, our applications of microelectronics have additional cutting edge requirements. For example, cryogenic operation, ultra low power consumption and radiation hardness. It turns out industry now is interested in all of these challenges, their requirements are easier than ours. We have more stringent requirements, and industry is very interested in working with us to co-develop a lot of these capabilities. To give you an, another idea, we were the first laboratory in the complex to put AI on a chip, and so advances now in to, I'm sorry to cut you off but I want to get a couple other questions in and I don't have much sure. time and that, sorry to cut you yeah. off I want to ask um, Dr. Barra uh, briefly how can basic research fields like high energy physics and nuclear physics more effectively support workforce issues and help our US high tech industries um, and if you can summarize and then I want to ask um, Dr. Green thank you for for your work how can we better communicate the importance of what we do to the general public Thank you Congresswoman um, so this is a very important area of, uh, for me personally and the department and the administration. Um, and uh, we are currently actually working on a comprehensive plan that would allow us to support a diverse, dynamic workforce that we could develop and support right here in the U.S. Um, so that we're, you know, providing the best training possible for the scientists that will go on to make the discoveries of the future, but also the workforce that will be needed for this highly technical industries um, out there. And you know, both the HEP and NP programs, for example, ha support a significant part of the training of the skilled workforce in these areas. And so providing the support, being very intentional about recruitment, um, being intentional about also um, Okay, sorry, <laughs> the buzzing sound. Um, being very intentional about the training, uh, recruitment, and retention of staff and um, is a very important priority area, and that's how we think it's, this is gonna work. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Green. So in 13 seconds, I would simply say that public engagement is cheap. So with a little bit of funding, you can have an army of scientists who are out there talking to the public and getting the public excited about these key ideas. I, I appreciate that and appreciate all, all your efforts to, to bring science to the, the, the people of this country and the world. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Baird, is now recognized. The gentleman from California, Mr. Albanalti, is now recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses. It's been a fascinating hearing. I'd like to continue the line of question, the questioning that Ranking Member Weber had started. Uh, like him, I'm very concerned about the supply chain issues that have arisen uh, in our radioisotope production. Uh, 
Mr. Guastella, I, I found in your written testimony some of the things that you had to say about that extremely interesting. You had pointed out that uh, it's possible to use commercial power reactors as neutron sources for the creation of radioisotopes, but you also pointed out that currently power reactors in the United States lack the technology to irradiate a target, which is really what you'd need to make this work. Uh, so a number of us here on the committee have been vocal advocates for next generation nuclear, uh, both fission and up upcoming fusion. But uh, the, uh, you know, really as we confront the, the pro problem of global climate change and decarbonization, nuclear energy is probably at this point the cleanest energy that mankind knows how to produce. And, you know, we think it's gotten a bad name. Next generation nuclear has amazing promise and much lower failure mode. So uh, as you see these next generation nuclear programs and the modular reactors come on board, is there a possibility for some synergy of designing in the technology to be able to create these radioisotopes as we develop these new reactors? Well, Congressman, thank, thank you for the question, and uh, yes, uh, as, as you uh, have acknowledged, uh, some of the power reactors in Canada, uh, generally can-do uh, reactors, um, are um, uh, using, uh, they're using the power reactors uh, as neutron sources uh, for uh, molly production, uh, as uh, well as lutetium-177, which is a, a beta-emitting isotope. Um, the current power reactors in the U.S. Uh, unfortunately uh, generally don't have the, the same type of uh, technology that allows them to uh, irradiate these targets while they're, while they're online. Um, we have one member, TerraPower, uh, a Bill Gates company, um, who is looking at the, a next generation uh, uh, a small modular reactor. Um, they're going to test it in Wyoming. Um, as far as I know, and, and we've asked this question, uh, TerraPower uh, does not plan to include medical isotope production uh, into their mission uh, and uh, into the design of the, of the, uh, of the reactor. Uh, I'm not aware of any of the, uh, of the other projects right now that are including medical isotope production. Uh, unfortunately, but uh, at what least... What would be the, the technical barriers to be able to, to, to uh, adding that kind of capability? Uh, to be honest, I'm not quite sure. Um, uh, we can certainly uh, look into that a little bit more and maybe provide uh, a response as a, a question for the record. But uh, in, in asking uh, TerraPower, who is looking at actinium-225 production in, in uh, partnership with the DOE, um, they've uh, basically said the design of their reactor uh, uh, does not allow right now for the uh, uh, for, for the uh, a production of medical isotopes um, but not sure of some of the other projects that uh, are currently uh, in development mm -hmm. uh, do you know if any other countries are planning on building in this technology it just seems like a uh, an incredible missed opportunity if we're having this supply chain uh, pressure not to take advantage of the fact that we're deploying this next generation technology currently? Yeah, uh, as far as next generation technology, I'm not aware. Obviously, there are projects in Europe right now, um, uh, research reactor projects that uh, are, are on the books right now, and with a design of uh, medical isotope uh, production as, as part of their mission. Uh, so there are some projects. I'm not aware of any uh, of the uh, next-gen small modular reactor projects involving uh, medical isotope production at this time. Well, thank you. Well, let me ask you, Dr. Berhe, uh, is this something that uh, your department is pursuing, uh, perhaps talking with the uh, Office of Nuclear Energy uh, as you interface between the, the radioisotope program and, and uh, this, this upcoming technology? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Um, we all agree that this is an important area. It's also fast moving in, in terms of the technical advances that are happening. Um, and rec I think you're, the point that you make is an important one. And the isotope program at DOE Office of Science continuously works with the uh, nuclear energy side of the house um, and other stakeholders to figure out what is what are the things that we should be thinking about. Because it's not just a production um, uh, program, right? It's also a research and development program so that we are thinking ahead about what are the new technologies that we're developing. So in consultation with the scientific community um, and the different stakeholders, they're continuously assessing what needs to be the next goal that we target. And just to mention one, the radioisotope production facility at Oak Ridge National Lab that's um, you know, in development, 
um, will actually have capacity to add a number of the isotopes that we currently source from Russia um, that are produced on a reactor um, and obviously will help accelerate the availability of radio a number of radioisotopes that are critical, including in the medical field. Wow, thank you. I see I'm out of time, but I'd like to encourage you to continue to have those discussions because it would certainly be a missed opportunity if we didn't build that capability into the new commercial power reactors that are in development. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Lamb, is now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to start off uh, with a question for Mr. Yak about the facility being built at Brookhaven. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of compare that for us to similar facilities around the world, um, if, if they exist, if direct comparison. In other words, you know, how, how urgent is it for us to complete and maintain that facility in order to ma maintain an edge over competitor nations, or are we merely matching them by um, building the facility at Brookhaven? Yes, thank you for the question. So the EIC, when it's constructed, will be a unique facility in the world, and there's worldwide interest, interest in the realization of the facility. It's been a priority obviously in the US, but also in the European community, and participation is encouraged. There is um, potential competition. I mean, China is interested in building an electron ion collider. They've made plans. We're ahead. We have a unique opportunity, as I mentioned in my testimony, with the con successful conclusion of the RIC program, which will end in 2025 with a workforce that can be mobilized immediately into the construction work of the EIC. The timing here is absolutely critical. We cannot lose these people. We need these people in addition to our partnerships and collaboration with Jefferson Lab and other laboratories and universities. So the timing is now for the realization of the electron ion collider and it will maintain U.S. leadership in this field with creating a facility that will have international interest and participation. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and, and Dr. Barra, to kind of enlarge that to the, all 28 of the user facilities under your purview, um, can you maybe update us on the, the overall state of those 28 in comparison to the portfolio of, of other nations? And has that changed over time? Like, in other words, are we, are we pulling ahead? Are other nations catching up in terms of the concrete user facilities that we have? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Um, I think it's fair to say that the U.S. remains one of the strongest, uh, you know, kind of uh, nations um, with, with respect to the user facilities that we have, the capabilities that the, and the science that they enable, um, and many of the research programs that um, enable and support the facilities remain one of the strongest um, anywhere, really. Um, but. I think it's important also to acknowledge that there are, in fact, nations out there, as we just heard, um, that are you know, also making similar investments in their institutions. Um, and so there is competition coming down the pike. I think um, that's widely acknowledged. But con continuing, I think, efforts to support these facilities um, is I think Gene will ensure that U.S. remains preeminent um, on top of our, uh, you know, on top of the of the field across many areas. These user facilities, as you mentioned, they're many, they're diverse, they're some of the most renowned in the world um, in the areas of research that they enable, and they remain important priority areas that are supported and have widespread support by the Office of Science. I agree. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Green, last question for you. You know, you've referenced several times some of the really important scientific um, and particularly physics discoveries of the 20th century. Uh, and, you know, my limited knowledge of that story is that a lot of the most important characters started off in Europe and found refuge in the United States uh, around the time of World War II and made many of their discoveries here as a result. Um, do you think that we are still seen around the world as a refuge and a destination of that type? And are these investments we're talking about today critical to our ability to continue that way? Yeah, I think we're definitely still seen as a center of forefront research and a place where scientists who aspire to great things will want to spend time here at American universities, at our national labs, and so forth. 
Um, but, you know, I think the, the, the more important lesson to my mind is that science is a worldwide effort. Sure, it's important for American competitiveness. We want to be the leaders and so forth. But ultimately, the questions that we're asking transcend national boundaries. And if I was going to use one model for the way the world could be a better place, we scientists, we speak to each other across national boundaries. It doesn't matter where you're from. What matters is the work that you do, the contribution that you make, the insight that you provide. And that, to me, is an inspiring message that really transcends national considerations and is a global concern that should drive us all. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Baird, is now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And my question uh, goes to Dr. Yick. You know, Purdue University, Purdue University is in my district, and it's just one of the institutions that have participated in research with the relativistic relativistic heavy ion collider. Uh, so I appreciate your testimony and your update uh, on the electron ion collider, the EIC. So here's my question. You noted in your testimony that funding for the, for the EIC has been well below that is required for most efficient construction models and schedules. How would such delays impact academic users and institutions anticipating the use of the EIC facility? Dr. Thank, Gek. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, the impact is profound. I mean, the delays in the realization of the EIC result in a gap. And many, there are many users involved, as you mentioned, from your district, that are involved in the science of the relativistic heavy ion collider and are planning for the science that will come with the electron ion collider. And so the plans that we've laid out and the funding plans that are proposed minimize the gap between the conclusion of RIC operations and the start of operations and the data taking with the electron ion collider. This is an issue that the plans have addressed, that funding is clear, clearly identified what is needed to minimize that gap. And so I think it, it is, the answer is it's profound. I mean, we need to move forward on the EIC now so that we can move the people that are interested in the science into the program in, a, in as graceful way as possible. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, Dr. Merming, uh, a number of news stories in recent months have featured concerns about, and it's along the same veins as this last question, about the progress of the LBNF and Dune. Uh, so including the costs in recent years extended completion times, and the decision to split this project into sub-projects. So in your new role, how do you plan to reassure international and institutional partners regarding Fermilabs and department's commitment to completing this project in a timely and cost-effective manner? Thank you very much for this question. <clears throat> and thank you for the opportunity to set the record straight. Um, the splitting in phases was something that was envisioned in the 2014 P5 report originally. It is not a recent development. LBNF and Dune, the Dune experiment was going to came in two phases. Phase one was the installation of two detectors in the far si South Dakota site and beam power from PIP2 equal to 1.2 megawatts. And then phase two was the installation of the remaining two, two detectors in South Dakota and increasing the beam power to 2.4 megawatts. That was originally conceived. Now, the LBNF experiment is proceeding on track. The far side excavation is already more than 30% the excavation complete. Uh, 800,000 uh, uh, tons of rock is being excavated right now. And furthermore, delays would be ve very uh, detrimental to the project. However, um, a couple of months ago, the Office of Science 
reaffirmed their commitment in front of our international partners in a funding a international funding agency uh, forum, their commitment to LBNF and UN, and announced a new funding profile that increases funding in 24 to 27 and allows completion of the project in early 2031, two years compared to the earlier profile, two years earlier, and in alignment with the original P5 expectations. So the way I'm going to convince the community is we're doing uh, still where the, the science is profound from LBNF and UN. Um, we are managing the cost. The cost has been stable to around three billion since 2019. We are delivering the project on schedule and, uh, and we're accelerating in order to win the competition as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate the witnesses and their expert testimony. I yield back. The gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Ross, is now recognized. Uh, thank you, Chairman Bowman and Ranking Member Weber for holding this hearing and to all of our witnesses for joining us. What's clear from the witness testimony today is the far reaching impact of particle and nuclear physics research. And I'm proud to say that my district is home to the world's first nuclear reactor used for teaching, research, and public service at the North Carolina State University School of Engineering. Uh, nuclear engineers at NC State University are at the forefront of research on neutrino detection to advance nuclear nonproliferation, food irradiation, you guys are gonna have help irradiation to prevent the transmission of pathogens and nuclear forensics and medical imaging. That work and the work of researchers at academic institutions across the country is more important than ever as we face both energy shortages and the ever present potential for nuclear conflict. So Dr. Green, as the only panelist today representing an academic institution, what are your thoughts on the interplay between the research community and these large scale experiments funded in the range of hundreds of millions to billions of dollars? And how do you think the federal government can better nurture relationships with our academic institutions, as well as improve partnerships with universities, national labs, and international projects? Great, thank you, thank you for the question. There's a enormously fruitful interplay between the national labs and academics at universities. Ever since I was a graduate student, the, the number of my colleagues, both as students and then when I was a faculty member as well, who freely moved between the university and various of the national labs, that's a commonplace occurrence. There are many graduate students at a given university, including my own, who spend most of their time at a national lab where their thesis work is part of the laboratory's work, part of the undertaking of that facility. So I think it's a very fruitful interplay between the two. And it's a vital one because look, the charge of a university is different from the charge of a national lab. We're seeking to both educate broadly as well as be a research institution managing a large scale facility is usually not within the purview of most universities. So I think it's a very symbiotic relationship between the labs and the academic universities in America. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Moringa, I understand that one of the areas of cutting edge uh, research in nuclear nonproliferation is the use of anti-neutrino detectors to monitor nuclear power plants from long distances. And North Carolina State University's Dr. John Mattingly is part of the team of researchers working on this potentially game-changing research. Could you speak a bit to the promise of this approach and other novel approaches to non-proliferation research? I'm sorry, I don't think I can speak to this. Okay. I, um, I, I, I will get back to you though. Does, any, does anybody else on the panel know anything about uh, non-proliferation research? 
Okay, well then I'll move to my last question and hopefully Dr. Moringa, you can um, speak to this. I was recently in Japan, which is moving rapidly on a competing project known as Hyper-K, which is similar to LBNF Dune. Can you briefly comment on the difference between the scientific approaches favored by LBNF Dune versus Hyper-K? I'm very happy to speak about this and thank you for the question. So um, Hyper-K is uh, a, an experiment that aims at similar scientific goals as the Dune experiment. However, it, follow, it, uh, it follows fundamentally different approaches. Um, simply put, Dune brings together exceptional capabilities due to the following key characteristics of the facility and the experiment. And I will draw the difference between Dune and Hyper-K. The, the, these experiments are called long baseline experiments because the distance, because of the long distance between the source where neutrinos are produced and where they are being detected at the far side. So for Dune, the distance is 1,300 kilometers, and for Hyper-K is 295 kilometers. Furthermore, the Dune experiment is going to be to, to have the most intense beam of neutrinos ever built in the world. Already the Fermilab complex delivers today the most intense beam of neutrinos with nearly 900 kilowatt of beam power today. And for Dune, we're going to go to 1.2 megawatt, eventually to 2.4 megawatt. And importantly, this beam of neutrinos is wide band. It has a wide band of energies that, that covers the oscillation spectrum. And the, os the neutrino oscillations is a key scientific objective of these experiments. And, Thank and third, you much. Oh, I see my time has expired, and Mr. Chair, I yield back. But thank you so much for that explanation. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Stevens, is now recognized. Our chair strikes again. An amazing hearing on investigating the nature of matter, energy, space, and time. Five amazing witnesses. I, I cannot believe what we are hearing. The quiet murmurs of the science committee ringing across the universe. One testimony alone from Dr. Bree. Neutrinos, quote, neutrinos uh, may hold the key to why matter exists at all in the universe as opposed to nothing. Quote, a broad range of, e of the epochs of the universe end quote in your testimony. That alone is just absolutely remarkable. Um, and we could spend all day with every one of you. So thank you so much for your expertise and your time. Um, we, we are certainly in a competitive moment. My, my colleague uh, referenced uh, our work in microelectronics and the chip shortage and supply chain disruptions. But this is broader. This is more international. And this is, dare we say, universal. So, so in terms of what we're looking at with, in, in, in my, you know, there's just so much to unpack here, but in terms of what we're looking at with isotopes, and, and this is of, of importance to us in Michigan, um, we've got this new isotope research lab, the FRIB, the, the Department of Energy's Michigan State University facility for rare um, isotope beams, and just last month everyone was all together, and we, we certainly want to talk about the importance of these programs, but but I actually, I would like to hone in, you know, in, in the testimony of Dr. Bree, you were talking about how we compare with Russia and how the, the war in Ukraine is impacting our abilities and that the U.S. and Russia are the, the only two in this type of space. How do you feel as though we are measuring up t today as it relates to the pandemic, a war, inflation, access to materials? and let me, let me pause on that question, then I'm going to come back and ask about CERN as well. Thanks. 
Thank you, Congresswoman Stevens. Um, I definitely share your excitement about the importance of this area and the questions. Um, and also, um, you know, I think everybody shares your excitement about the EFRIB uh, facility that was newly opened in, at Michigan State University, which I might say is my alma mater too. Uh, <laughs> so um, to kind of answer your question about where, where do we stand in terms of, um, you know, kind of um, our ability to produce and, and supply these isotopes though, um, I think it's fair to say we are in a much better place now than we would have been if we didn't have a lot of the contingency planning in, 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 this, in, in place. Um, but I think this problem is pretty wide uh, spread and, um, and unfortunately affects not just us, but it basically affects the whole world um, as a lot of the isotope supply systems um, had been concentrated in Russia for a long period of time. But right now, um, you know, Again, even though we're not expecting, and we're pretty, uh, everybody's pretty clear about the fact that there are no c quick fixes, um, the, there's actually quite a lot of improvements that have been made. Um, there are roughly, for example, 31 radioisotope supply chains in which the U.S. had dependence on Russia, and 19 of them are have experienced some disruptions. But um, of those, the DOE isotope program has developed capabilities to produce 19, and another 11 of them are at various stages of development. So that says that we're 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 doing okay, um, but we're continue we're going to have to continue to work on this. And well, in in Mr. Gustala's group, which is talking about this association of companies in the U.S. and Canada and what we manufacture. You know, I do manufacturing Monday. Every Monday I go to a small manufacturer and geek out with them. That and this committee will, will keep you sane in the Congress in these polarized times. But we signed a trade deal, as you know, um, uh, renegotiated NAFTA. Are, are you seeing us, are you seeing that help us, helping us compete in terms of what we're talking about here? Obviously, we've got a global you know, race going on here, but is that benefiting some of the, the work in in the space that, that your your association is focused on with radionuclides and radiopharmaceuticals? Well, thank you for the question. Um, the uh, Most of the radioisotopes, um, and I'd say well over 90 percent, are sourced uh, either from Europe, Russia, South Africa, uh, Australia, um, and uh, we do uh, obviously work with uh, uh, Canada. Some of our member companies obviously work with uh, manufacturers uh, uh, in, in Canada. The actual impact of the, uh, the trade agreement, I, I can't speak to, mm -hmm. uh, but I can say that we've had a long relationship with uh, organizations in Canada. And in fact, we have uh, some organizations within CORE that are based in Canada. So we have a, we have a nice cross uh, relationship between the two countries. A, a, fan, a fantastic border and a fa fantastic part of our supply chain. And, and thank you with that. Um, I'll, I'll yield back, Mr. Chair. The gentleman from Illinois, Dr. Foster, is now recognized. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and to our witnesses. I, at first, I'd like to echo my congratulations to Dr. Berhe and to Dr. Merminga uh, on your new roles. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, the chairman and the ranking member uh, for their opening statements, which articulated very clearly the strong bipartisan support, uh, both for the flagship Department of Energy facilities that are essential to maintaining U.S. leadership in fundamental science and the DOE's contributions to immediate concerns like medical isotopes. Uh, we've also been very encouraged uh, recently to hear President Biden lament the fact that the R&D intensity, the fraction of GDP that we devote to R&D, has dropped precipitously from its historic levels. So at a time when our nation's GDP is growing strongly, uh, faster than inflation, fixing that should mean significant real increases in the research budgets of DOE's Office of Science and should in fact be growing even faster than our GDP. Uh, but when we see budget proposals, both from the administration and from our appropriations committees, which for many accounts do not even cover inflation, we realize how far short of the mark we're falling, and perhaps gain some insight into the mechanisms that have promoted the short-term thinking that got us into the situation that really is putting our scientific, our scientific leadership at risk. 
Now, as a member of the House Science Conference Committee on the Competes Act, I'm confident that we will be authorizing a budget envelope to begin with storing our, to begin restoring R&D intensity to historic levels, but these must be followed through by appropriations. You know, for example, uh, Dr. Barry, in your testimony, you wrote in depth about the DOE National Lab infrastructure and some of the needs of the network of labs of the Office of, of the Labs that Office of Science oversees. Last year, Senator Lujan and I introduced the Restore and Modernization Our National Labs Act, which authorizes $30.5 billion in funding for the national laboratories to address this critical, shovel-ready backlog of overdue infrastructure repairs and improvements. I was very pleased that we were able to include this legislation in the America Competes Bill as an amendment and hope that it survives the conference committee. So uh, Dr. Berhe, could you uh, speak a little bit about how funding di specifically directed at laboratory infrastructure would assist your ability to prioritize and execute uh, the series of projects that really are essential to maintain a healthy enterprise? Thank you very, very much, Congressman Foster. Um, I first would like to start by thanking you and the committee for the support that we've received in, in, in this area. Um, as you've articulated very well, uh, we all agree that the maintaining the infrastructure and the facilities and operations at the national labs is critical for the science that we conduct. It's also critical for us to be able to, again, train, recruit, and retain the next generation of scientists um, that will take on the next challenges, both in, you know, in research as well as in industry. So, um, you know, we're const constantly evaluating the needs in consultation with the national labs um, and figuring out how to prioritize, obviously, the, the infrastructure projects that cannot wait, that will lead to even bigger problems if they're not addressed, or um, ones that are urgent. So figuring out basically all the ways that we have um, um, at our disposal to balance the different, many different competing needs. But I think we're all on the same page about but the need to address um, you know, of infrastructure and facilities ops and all very, very supportive of have you all as partner um, as we address the, as we seek more support and funding to address um, these challenges, which I think are extremely important um, and Thank you. And uh, Dr. Menga, Mr. Yak, uh, could you just describe briefly what it's like being a project manager of something where in a laboratory where there's a big backlog of overdue infrastructure repairs and that a lot of these infrastructure repairs get offloaded onto your project and making your project look more expensive than it might otherwise have to be? It's, I'm sure it's a, a universal experience. And so if you could, um, we'll start with Dr. Menga. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Um, I must say that uh, uh, as the project director of the PIP2 project, uh, we were very fortunate to have some uh, GPP projects, general uh, uh, infrastructure, infrastructure, sorry, projects, infrastructure projects um, that uh, were complementary and necessary for the PIP2 project to advance. And so these were executed, were mostly funded by the SLI program and were executed in time, on time, and so uh, that was very helpful for us. Yeah, and my time is up, but I would get, Mr. Yak, if you just acknowledge that you've had comparable experiences in managing projects. I, Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> my my time is up. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, if it was feasible, I'd be interested in another round of questions. If if the witnesses and our time can accommodate. Yep. Yep. So I'm going to ask. I'm going to begin another round of questions. Uh, if that's okay with the witnesses. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Just. Yep. So I I'll start. Um, and my question is for Dr. Green. Uh, Dr. Green, your expertise is in the area of research called string theory, which hundreds, maybe even thousands of physicists around the world are currently studying. If proven, it could fulfill Einstein's dream of having a theory of the universe, a set of mathematical formulas that explains all of our physical laws. But is such a theory even provable? Are there extremes of nature that we can never achieve and examine up close to tests these theories? Yes, thank you for the question. I indeed, your summary is correct. There are many of us in America and around the world who are trying to realize the dream that Einstein initially articulated 
of a single set of mathematical laws that would govern the entire universe, the big, the small, and everything in between. So it is a hugely ambitious undertaking. Remarkably, we have a theory on the table, the one you mentioned, string theory. That may be the theory that Einstein was looking for, but the key question you ask is, is it testable? And we don't know. As of today, our technology and our understanding is probably too limited to be able to specify a test that could establish the theory right or refute it. But that's what research is all about. We are working intensely on the mathematical aspects of the theory to try to bring our understanding to a point where we can make predictions that perhaps some of the machines that we're hearing about on the panel might one day be able to test. So we would not be working on the theory if it were somehow fundamentally, philosophically unprovable, but it's a challenge to prove a theory that manifests its distinct characteristics at enormously high energies and incredibly small distances. So the answer probably is best summarized as not yet, but hopefully in the future. Thank you so much. I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Weber, for our question. Oh, gosh, that was even quick. Thank you. I appreciate that. I can answer part of that last question. That is, as long as I do what my wife says, things add up. And if I don't, not so much. That's the most important uh, answer for me. Uh, Mr. Guastel, in your written testimony, you state that your organization's members support private sector production report and isotopes. What are some of the major barriers to the domestic commercial production? This is going to be kind of a three-part question of important medical and industrial isotopes for which we currently rely on other countries or DOE production. What are some of the major barriers to domestic commercial production of those? What suggestions do you have for the DOE isotope program for encouraging and supporting private sector production, number two? And then number three, does it concern, should we be concerned? Uh, in earlier testimony, one of the uh, things about the EIC, for example, uh, or EC, I can't read my own hand scratch, was that it was motivating the interest of collaborators all around the world. Do we trust that? How do we vet them? How do we know that they're not here just to steal our information? I'll yield to you. Well, Congressman Weber, thank you uh, for, the, uh, for the question. Um, first of all, uh, 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 Dr. Berhe uh, has mentioned on a few occasions that the, the technology can be somewhat complicated uh, and certainly capital intensive. So I, I would say with some of the, the newer isotopes, um, uh, and depending on the uh, opportunities, if you will, for commercialization, um, those can uh, create barriers. And that's why in certain instances, um, industry has relied on uh, the, the DOE isotope program, and the DOE isotope program has been a great, uh, great partner. Let me add something real quick. Does sure. the NRC get involved in that process that you're describing? Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, and uh, we, we deal with uh, not only the NRC, but the FDA, the DOT, uh, international organizations like, like the IAEA. Uh, so when you're talking about manufacturing and transporting uh, radioactive materials, uh, obviously you have to satisfy regulations from, from all those uh, regulatory bodies. Um, I mean, we have uh, several uh, suggestions that I've included in our testimony. One uh, mentioned uh, earlier, and that is fully fund the, uh, the Stable Isotope Production and Research Center uh, and the uh, Radioisotope Processing Facility. Uh, the DOE, from my understanding, uh, uh, is in desperate need of uh, additional uh, processing capabilities. Uh, and um, uh, having, those, uh, having those facilities uh, come online sooner rather than later would be very important to uh, increase the ability to, to have those uh, isotopes produced uh, uh, in, in the U.S. Um, also uh, came up a But there are entities in your group that stand ready, willing, and able to get on board with that if, if that becomes a possibility. Uh, Absolutely. I think, though, that kind of leads to my response in the, in the second part of your question, and that is kind of uh, to introduce, if you can, opportunities to expedite production commercially, and that may be in uh, providing um, uh, public-private type opportunities. Now, I understand right now that uh, the DOE isotope program, uh, it's not part of their mission, um, but uh, public-private uh, funding opportunities uh, in the future could 
accelerate the, uh, the introduction of uh, commercial production of uh, some of these isotopes that we're relying on, on Russia right now. Um, so that would uh, certainly be another opportunity. You know, another thing I would mention is um, uh, what I hear sometimes is that the importance of isotopes may not be fully real realized through the government and, and the administration. And uh, we've also suggested and requested that the uh, administration uh, institute a White House level um, supply coordinating effort. Uh, we found that to be very successful when we had issues with uh, uh, molybdenum. Uh, mol uh, molybdenum is uh, an important isotope. The daughter isotope of molybdenum is technesium-99, which uh, basically is used in about 80% of all nuclear medicine procedures. And uh, the DOE, ISIT, uh, the DOE uh, obviously was uh, very involved in helping uh, to move towards domestic production of Mali. But we found that the coordination uh, within the administration and the OSTP uh, was also helpful and brought to light uh, a number of issues uh, that uh, needed to be addressed as we were moving towards domestic production. I'm running out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to yield back. And unfortunately, I have another meeting that I have to leave for. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The chair now yields to Ms. Stevens from Michigan. Thank you. Um, as it pertains to, to CERN and our, our collaboration um, with the European Organization for, for Nuclear Research, um, and this is also the Large Hydron Collider that we've all been Right. reading about for the balance of a, of a decade and recognizing as the world's largest and highest energy um, particle collider. I, I was just actually wondering if, if any of you could, could shed some light on how that collaboration is going. How prominent is the United States in that collaboration? Um, how much will we receive from that collaboration and its benefits? Why is it located in Europe and not the, the United States for the, the kids watching home? Yeah, Dr. Maringa, we'll start with you. Thank you very much. So I would say CERN is our uh, most important partner in high energy physics in the US right now. Um, as you know, particle physics um, is, is the, the experiments and the facilities and infrastructure are of such great scale that in order to, really, to realize our collective ambition worldwide, um, we have split, if you like, and so Europe has the energy frontier with a large Hadron Collider, and the US participates in great numbers in those experiments at the LHC, as well as we participate in the upgrades to the LHC, both the accelerator and, and, and the And who's paying for that? Is it, is, it our, uh, is it monies to your agency, or how, how is that being supported? DOE is supporting the upgrades to the LHC. And at the same time, CERN is contributing to our Dune experiment because okay. the neutrino science is in the US. And our aspiration with the completion of LBNF and Dune is that Fermilab in the US becomes the world center for neutrino science. And CERN, for the first time in its 60-year history, is investing in infrastructure into Dune and in fact, they're contributing the two cryostats for the two detectors that will go in South Dakota for the Dune experiment. Yeah. And they're paying for this. So it's truly a reciprocal relationship. And in, in, yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Bree. I would completely agree with Leah um, on this point. It, both at CERN and uh, the, uh, you know, the ongoing projects at LBNF Dune, uh, they're both collaborative in that the U.S. contributes financially to making the CERN experiments happen, uh, but our scientists in turn get a huge part of the benefit, um, and they get to participate and be, you know, leaders in the science in the areas of CERN. And once you know the LBNF Dune is re realized and it, it's completed, um, then the European scientists will also be important partners here in the U.S. And this field, as you've heard, is a very highly inter international, multidisciplinary um, inter uh, collaborations are what make it possible. Yeah, and and so we just want Fermi to have the same attention 
that 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 you know CERN is getting in many respects. I mean, we want to be seen as as the leader, and it it appears from both of your responses that. We, we have the human capital. We have the trained and ready scientists who we can send over to, to CERN. You know, we've spent a lot of time on this committee, and I'm a subcommittee chair for research and technology on you know, our scientific research enterprise, um, our, our STEM education workforce, making sure we're not leaving our own talent behind. But some of that is so dependent on these global exchanges, right? And and so, you know, if we've got people going over there, they've got folks coming over here. And and, and let's just just again for the folks watching back home, and, and and obviously it should be everyone's homework to read these testimonies because they're brilliant. But but what are we getting out of that partnership? I mean, how is this going to impact um, uh, industries of scale or even our economy, as it's appropriate to, to ask? Because it's not just research for research sake. I mean, this has got wide-ranging applications into how we live, conduct business, tra transport ourselves and on, if I'm, if I'm right. Yeah. I just wanted to say, in addition to um, training our workforce, uh, we're getting, as I mentioned earlier, AI on a chip was first tried for the CMS detector, which is a detector of the LHC. And so microelectronics are also originate from research in order to sort out data collected by the LHC. And, and quantum computing as well. So a lot of these advances have then societal applications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Transfer to technology. Thank you. Yeah, as both Dr. Meminga as well as Dr. Green and, and others have spoken to, we get a lot of benefits from these fundamental science experiments. They may be curiosity driven, trying to understand the fundamental processes and nature of matter and, and other issues. But eventually, we get sometimes even benefits that we didn't even realize they're going to be possible, right? Benefits that are byproducts of the, you know, the scientists working on the process itself. But I think we don't even have to go far, as uh, Dr. Meminga just explained. We've already realized a lot of benefits for society, for you know, for industrial applications and others. Um, and I think the field is rich. We are only continue to benefit going forward. Right. Well, and, and Dr. Green, too, we appreciate you you being here. You you are right in the room with us. And and it's, uh, it, look, this is just so um, exciting. It's, it's really wide ranging. And I think even to the point about where we're going with, with nuclear, uh, you know, there's, again, en energy benefits. And so we can come back on, on more hearing topics on this front. Our, our chair is totally focused on the, these, these subject matters. And I, I think in terms of its budget season and how we're funding our agencies and making sure your work is funded, this couldn't be more timely. So with that, Mr. Acting Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you. Well, thank you. And as uh, Chair pro, pro Tem of this committee, um, I will now recognize myself for the final five minutes of questions here. Um, I, you know, I've always found that Congress understands well the near-term needs like you know, supply chain and uh, uh, medical isotopes and things like that. We have a lot of trouble understanding uh, the um, you know, the benefits of fundamental research that are harder to explain and the payoff is much longer term. Uh, Dr. Merminga, you sit on the, uh, stand on the shoulders of, of giants at your laboratory, and, you know, Dr. Wilson, Letterman, Peoples, Witherell, Adone, Lockyer. But your first predecessor, you know, your, um, the, you know, Dr. Wilson, the founder of Fermilab, uh, when he was pressed by a senator and in front of a committee um, many decades ago about what of what use uh, the research, the fundamental research that's done at Fermilab is, that you know what what exactly does Fermilab's research have to do with uh, national defense? Um, he responded with some with a with a response which I think which echoes today. Um, so when he was asked, what is it that Fermi Labs research has to do with national defense, say, or whatever the question of the day is, do you recall his answer? Absolutely. <laughs> it has nothing to do with um, uh, national defense, but it makes the country worth defending. That's right. And that is the, the correct answer. Um, it, it's also important to remember that um, when we think about the, uh, the difficulties of international collaboration, 
uh, Robert Wilson always was proud that in the depths of the Cold War, when Fermilab was founded, when when uh, you know Russian soldiers were shooting anti-aircraft missiles at American pilots in Vietnam, um, we at the same time one of the first experiments that was conducted at Fermilab had Russian collaborators, and um, and the, it. You know, so it's a two-edged sword. We have to be very careful to protect our, our real national interest. Uh, but the benefits of international collaboration are not just the dollars that come into experiments. Like, um, uh, Mr. Yak, is there a significant international interest in uh, the electron-ion collider? Yes, thank you. The, uh, the user community, which was formed in 2016 and now reaches over 1,300 members from 250 institutions, is about half U.S. and half worldwide. And so there's a significant interest, and they together developed a report on the planned science that the EIC can deliver and how best to deliver it with the detectors. It's fully international. It, so I would say the, the EIC will be an international facility. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Mamega. I'd like to also add a couple of more points on this. As you said correctly, to my opinion, it's the benefits from international collaboration go are a lot more than just the monetary benefits, the in-kind contribution to the facility. We, in the case of PIP2 and LBNF Dune, we really gather from around the world the world's best experts in the corresponding technologies. And those experts contribute their expertise, their capabilities, their own facilities in their own countries to develop infrastructure that's going to uh, be housed in a U.S. soil, on U.S. soil, to enhance our scientific infrastructure here in the U.S. And, and I'd like to point out that Fermilab has taken international collaboration to the next level through the recent LBNF Dune and PIP2 with more than a billion dollars in contribution, as I mentioned earlier. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Green, um, I will be asking you a question for the record about the implications of wick rotations on lattice gauge theories, which always seem to me to just fundamentally alter the locality and causality of these theories uh, because of the trying to hide the granularity um, from after the wick rotation. And so I'll be asking you about that. Uh, but more, um, more immediately, you know, you and I both struggle with the difficulty of explaining complex science in simple terms to the public. Uh, and particularly doing that without simplifying it too much so that it makes this, your scientific friends cringe at the oversimplification. Could you say a little bit about what you found the effective techniques for that is, because it's crucial. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, and thank you for the question. It is part of the art of trying to find the right language, the right visual metaphors for communicating some of the most abstract of ideas to the general public. And you don't want to turn your explanation into a cartoon or caricature. The goal is to find the core understanding and find a bridge between the unfamiliar and the familiar so you can cross that bridge and bring these insights to the general audience. And if I was going to give one, one lesson learned, it would simply be this. If we teach and communicate science as a narrative, as a story, as a human endeavor, not just the cold hard facts that make it into the textbook, not just the equations, but if we give the narrative of discovery so that you see the human part of the journey, then the drama of scientific adventure comes across in a sparklingly clear way. And I find that that's the most powerful way of inspiring the general public with these ideas. Uh, thank you. And as, as someone who brings you know, all the charisma of the, the typical physicist to this job, I really appreciate it when an artist like yourself gets involved in this. Um, thanks much. I will yield back to the, the chairman. Thank you. Before we bring the hearing to a close, I want to thank our witnesses for testifying before the committee today. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions the committee may ask of the witnesses. The witnesses are excused and the hearing is now adjourned.